Morag Barrett, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Hi, Howie. I'm excited for our conversation. Uh, so first of all, where, where, where are you right now in the world? Oh, well, it's good that you asked because I've been getting back on aeroplanes again now that the uh, pandemic is over easing. I don't know whether we're between pandemics. So today I am coming to you from Colorado. Oh, OK. Is that where you live or you're just on the yeah, road? Yeah, it is. No, that's okay. where I live. I live in hotels when I'm on the road. But moved here in 2005 from the UK and love it. I mean, it's a beautiful state and part of the country and haven't yet found somewhere that I want to live more than I want to live here. Hmm. In, uh, in one of the cities or out in the country? So I'm just between Denver and Boulder. So I'm in Burbia, as it is in Colorado, but the town's called Broomfield. Okay. Gotcha. I was just, before we got on the, on the call together, I was watching the Ultimate Frisbee cl cl Club Finals and the team from Denver uh, defeated the team from D.C., so, oh, wow. So. That's a game I've never played, but I've seen it and it looks exhausting and so forth. So are you a fan or was that by accident that you call Ultimate Frisbee? No, I'm a player. Uh, uh -huh. so I, 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 watch, I watch to get tips from the youngins. Okay. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Well, that's so. still on my someday, possibly never, but I'll watch it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've, uh, there's, a, there's a great community out where you are. So, um, but we're not here to talk about Ultimate Frisbee per se, although we are here to talk about sort of working together as a team and becoming friends with each other. Um, you just uh, dropped a book, you and your, and your Sky team dropped a book called You, Me, We. Here's one I happen to have on my desk, Howie. But you're right, we did. Eric, Ruby and I um, put our pens together, if we look at it in old fashioned terms, Actually, our word processors, well, no, that's still somewhat old. We put our computer brains together and collaborated on You, Me, We, Why We All Need a Friend at Work and How to Show Up as One. So that has been our big push for the last two years because obviously hitting the shelves is just the, the tip of the iceberg of the effort that goes into writing and publishing a book. So it's been really exciting. Yeah, so I want to find out more about you and your background. But the first thing that comes to me is I've collaborated on books um, several times with a bunch of different authors, but never two other authors. And I'm just try I'm trying to like the, com the level of complexity seems to be exponentially greater when you get above one. And then certainly when you get above two, I'm curious, did you guys have to apply the lessons in the book to writing the book? Absolutely. And in fact, if we didn't live the lessons in the book, I don't know that we would have written the book. So it's a bit like a chicken and egg conversation. But here's the thing. I was thinking about that as you talked about it there, the complexities of writing, Howie. And my first book, Cultivate the Power of Winning Relationships, I wrote on my own. Except I didn't really because six months into writing it and I'd written a couple of chapters, I knew I was never going to get through it if I tried to do it as a solo sport. So I actually put together a uh, book advisory board. It was six leaders, three who knew me well and three who did not. They'd just graduated from my program. And what would happen is I would write a chapter. I would send it to them for feedback. We'd get on a conference call. They'd give me feedback and then I'd send them the next one and then the edits. And so that little piggyback approach got me to the end of Cultivate the Power of Winning Relationships. And that sets the tone for You, Me, We because I introduce what I call the relationship ecosystem and the concept of allies, our best friends at work, the people who have your back no matter what. And in fact, my book advisory board, Howie, this will make you laugh. On the very first call, um, we got onto it. I said, OK, so what did you think of the chapter? And then there was this long silence. And then one of my colleagues, Dale Nip, in fact, I spoke to him only this morning, but he came on and he goes, um, well, was it just me or was it really boring? <laughs> and I can still remember to this day putting my head on the table because that was exactly the feedback I needed. And he set the tone for the rest of the calls where they pull no punches and they helped me to write an excellent book. And then the second book I wrote with Dr. Linda Sharkey, who you know, The Future Proof Workplace. And now here we come, the You, Me, We, my third book, but written with three co-authors. 
And my learning along the way was we spent, we've spent a number of years with this content, teaching it in our programs, using it in our keynotes. So we were familiar with each other's perspective on it. But setting down what was this book going to be? What was it not? How were we going to weave our voices together? We did that before we even started. And I think that helped tremendously. And uh, so did our learning as we went through it. So there you go. A bit of a long answer to how do you write with three people? Carefully is the answer. Mm. <laughs> well, I, I love the story about, you know, getting that feedback after, after um, you know, a pregnant silence. Um, yeah. It, it speaks to the, the ecosystem that you talk about in terms of what are the other, these five sort of elements that you identify as, a, you know, part of a culture in which there can be friends and best friends and allies at work. And so this, you know, that one's under candor and debate. And yes. I, th I think it's a lot easier to ask for feedback about a work that you know is a draft than to get that kind of candid feedback about yourself, you know, especially since like you can go your whole career without getting negative feedback if you play your cards wrong, right? If you, you know, if you yeah. appear like you wouldn't be grateful for it or it might be dangerous to give it to you or the, it never comes up. Whereas if you're putting a book out, you know that like a lot of people can go to Amazon and say whatever they want. So it's mm -hmm. interesting to think and like what, that point. what, what enabled candor in that situation that we can learn from and bring to other situations where candor might be equally useful, but harder to acquire. Well, it's interesting you talk about that because the you, you, me, we, why we all need a friend at work and how to show up as one. The, the reason we wrote it was that the ecosystem that for those of you who are watching the episode, you can see over my shoulder, there is a, a little diagram. And if you're just listening, well, you can go buy the book and you'll be able to see it there. Um, but people, it was resonating and people were understanding how to diagnose the health of their relationships. But we were asked, well, but how do I show up as an ally? How do I show up as a best friend without becoming a doormat or a yes person? How do I be a friend to myself as well as a friend to my colleague? And so we went back to all of our research over the last 10 years since Cultivate has been out. We have had more than 500 leaders take our ally mindset profile. And in fact, the listeners to this podcast, I invite you to do the same and get your own insights to how you're showing up at work. And to get to that, you go to Sky Team, S K Y E team.cloud, as in cloud in the sky, forward slash you, would, you, me, we. And you can take that with our compliments. But what it will do is it will help you to identify your strengths and areas for opportunities in five key areas, five practices that we've identified from our research makes for an ally relationship, a best friend at work, invariably a colleague you would jump at the chance to work with again. And you mentioned one of those, they're actually all double barrels. So you can argue me, with me later that there's actually 10, but we have them as five and candor and debate is one of them. And the reason they're du double barreled is that they're about the human being, your mindset and approach to work, but they are also about the human doing and mm. how you manifest it. And the reason I say that is I've seen too many leaders, I've worked with too many leaders for whom candor comes naturally, but it's in a pull the pin, throw the candor grenade and sit back and watch the drama unfold. What they're not also as good at is leaning into the conversation for how do we solve for this truth speaking, this problem or this challenge. So that's why they're double barreled. And the reason I like the fact that you just randomly picked Candrum Debate is, even though I've written two books at this, Candrum Debate is the, one of the five practices that I actually struggle with. Because feedback, when it's building our workshop and program materials and making them better, I can do easily. 
candor when I'm coaching an executive leader and calling BS on their mindset or what they need to do to move forward comes easy. But giving tough feedback to somebody, I go like a pussycat and I'm a big chicken. So for me, paying attention to candor and debate is something that I need to invest in so that I can be the best version of me to help you be the best version of you. So again, a bit of a long answer, but it is why this is so powerful. And we're getting such great feedback from folks who've had advanced copies of the book or are now receiving it and reading it today. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I find really helpful as a coach is that those five uh, or 10 barrels um, allow people just to look at the graphic and, mm -hmm. I, and immediately assess, oh, like this is what is missing on our team. Yep. Right. And you make Agreed. a very clear case that, that they're, they're a, a system that, that without that each of them is required to have a team that functions well and gets along and, and grows. Exactly. So for those who can't see over my shoulder the pinwheel, it starts with abundance and generosity. So my mantra has always been that success is a shared resource, not a scarce resource. And if you don't have that abundant mindset, then you're not going to be generous, whether that's with your expertise, your advice, with the talent on your team in helping others to achieve their goals. It will likely result in a me first approach. So abundance and generosity is the foundational practice. Because then when I'm interested in you and your success, then I can get to the second element, which is connection and compassion. And that means connecting with you beyond just the job title that we all bring to the office, but connecting with you and your life journey, other experiences and talents that we could tap into. It is connecting with compassion so that if you're having an off day or there's something happening in your bigger life, um, we can support you through it, knowing that at some point I'm going to have an off day and you will be able to support me. And if you get the connection and compassion piece right, that's where you get to psychological safety, high trust. That's what drives courage and vulnerability. And courage and vulnerability is all about the risk of speaking up, courage, the vulnerability, but it might come back to bite me. It's taking informed risk. So if we want to innovate and be creative, we need courage and vulnerability on the team, which then gets to candor and debate, which we've talked about. And then the capstone of them all is action and accountability. And again, I've worked with so many executive teams that talk a good show, but then don't follow it through with the actions necessary to hold themselves or others accountable for the results that are needed or the values and behaviors in terms of how business gets done. So they're all connected. And each of us has a natural tendency for one or more, but also like me, has an innate need for extra care and attention in one or more areas. And that's what the framework and the Ally Mindset Profile is providing. Hmm. So as I read the book and was taking notes and reflecting on it, one of the things that I, can, I you know, like when I read a book, I like to argue with it, like as if the author's right there. Oh, like, what, what about this? I don't, I don't know. And one of the things I kept bouncing back and forth with, and you've you kind of raised the, the issue in several uh, examples already, is that the context makes a huge difference in how we show up. So there are ways in which you are naturally defaulting to pussycat. Oh, I, you know, I don't want to give feedback. Yeah. And there are times where you can, you know, you know, you'll poke the bear, as you said uh, to, to Mitchell Levy in, in your uh, appearance yeah. on this podcast, where, you know, you're the same person, but certain situations allow for or make it easier or lower the threshold for you to, uh, to adopt one of, you know, these pinwheel um, yes. beings, beings and doings. So I kept on saying, like, is this a book for the individual or is this really a book for the leader to say, we, you know, we have to create an organization in which these behaviors are empowered and encouraged mm -hmm. and possible. So which, which, how did you 
which conclusion did you come to? Is it for the individual or is it for the organization or is it both? Well, I, I think you're talking to both, um, you know, sort of top down, bottom up. Um, but it's fascinating for me that you, with all your experience and self-awareness, um, are, can still, and, and like me and everyone, can still be so heavily influenced by context and framing. Well, I think it's important, and, and each of the chapters ends with what we call look up, show up, step up. And what I know from my own career is I've been so stuck on the hamster wheel, head down, not looking up, doing the same old, same old. I have not been intentional about thinking, how do others feel in my presence? How do I feel in my own? What is needed for this next conversation, this next meeting? Is it the chatty, pushy, poke the bear morag, or is it the quiet, supportive, reflective, coaching morag? And in the book, um, we share an example of this because Eric is a rock star, literally. He plays in numerous bands. I, on the other end of the spectrum, am a classical musician, and I used to perform for a local symphony orchestra. Well, you think about going to either of our concerts, our gigs. If you go to Eric's, and I have done this, and you sit on the sidelines and you quietly um, clap and applaud, he's going to be up on stage going, what the heck, why aren't you dancing? Why aren't you, like, getting your groove on? Now, if you come to one of my symphony orchestra concerts and you're trying to get your groove on and you're getting a little dancey, it's likely to get you ejected from the conference hall. So it is about intentionality. How do I remain authentic to myself, but turn the dial up or down to meet the needs of the organizational culture, the leader in front of me? Are they brand new into their career or do they have 40 years experience? Is this the first time I've met them or is, have we got a few months or several engagements under our belt, in which case my level of direct pokingness may well go up? than if we're only on a first date where we might still be setting rules of engagement. But here's the thing. If you can sit down and articulate, okay, Mr. CEO or Ms. CEO, what does, how do you want me to bring you bad news? Because trust me, people are going to share stuff in your company that you need to hear. And if we can contract for that early, make the implicit explicit, it makes it a darn sight easier for everybody because now I'm not guessing. And or we're still holding back for fear of unintended consequences. And that's what we're talking about in You, Me, We. How do we get to that sweet spot of high trust relationships sooner so that we can get to the real magic of the work that we need to do together? Yeah, I, I love that. And I love how it's, you know, it's about turning up the dial. It's not dichotomous, right? It's not like this is good, that's bad. No. Uh, right? There are places there are places and times for competition and for yeah. cooperation. Uh, but you know, you do begin by saying like uh, you know, the abundance mindset, abundance and generosity is kind of fundamental to a group of people who have a shared mission. I'm thinking about I don't remember the details of the study, but it was basically having people play like the prisoner's dilemma game. Oh, two, yes. And it was either called the community game or the stock exchange game. Oh, and, yep. All right. Everything else about the both the, the, the two different groups was identical in protocol, except the name. And when you called it the community game, people were far more communal. They were far more generous, trusting than when you called it the stock market game. And I'm thinking like, organizations so often, maybe without intending, create uh, environments in which scarcity and competition, mm -hmm. um, you know, are, are the default. Like what we're thinking, what I'm thinking about here is how do I advance my career? How to protect myself from people me who are first. trying to un undermine me? How do I get my bonus when the layoffs come? How does my division not get touched as much as anybody else's division? How do the ideas that I come up with get credited to me and not to somebody else? Yeah, and then we wonder why politics silos and turf wars run rife. And of course, when you have that sort of attitude and mindset, then information slows down. 
um, decision quality is undermined and you actually help create the very end result of subpar performance that you're trying to avoid. And heaven forbid, if you then find yourself on the job market because of a downsizing, then you are less likely to have the people around you who have your back and who are helping you to land that next opportunity. Everything comes down to the quality of our working relationships. And when we can get past it, I mean, that's what threw me when I first entered the workforce just one or two years ago. But I've been told it's not personal, it's just business. Hmm. And you think about schooling, it's all me first. Can I ex um, graduate in the top X percent of my school? Can I beat the exam board? And in fact, teamwork and community is described as cheating. So we're not encouraged to do it. And yet you get into the world of work, it's the biggest team sport because I can be the best leadership facilitator, executive coach in the world. But if your sales team isn't then bringing in the opportunities, I'm going to struggle. I can be the best coach with the best sales team. But if we don't have the operations team who can help administer the assessments that we use, create the materials, then ultimately our reputations and our impact is going to falter. And so in fighting that politics always bamboozled me as being such a wasted effort when we're all playing for the same team, the same brand, we should be outward focused, pulling together, not inward focused, fighting against each other. Yeah, and I, and I loved what you talked about, about education being essentially, you know, training us to be competitive, to look out for number one at the exclusion of everyone else. For many years, I, I was a school teacher. I taught at a small progressive Quaker school that, mm. that did a bunch of stuff very intentionally to, to counteract that. Like one, one thing was there was no grades. You know, when you took a quiz or a test or handed in a paper, you would get feedback. But mm -hmm. it, would, it would never compare you to anyone else. So there was never this feeling of there's only so many A's to go around. Um, mm -hmm. The second thing was whenever whenever there was a there was a spelling mistake, um, the rule was you couldn't write it on the paper. You had to put a post it because you didn't want to sort right. of mar the work and say, like, mark the work. But you wrote down the misspelled word and that was all because every student had to come up with 10 spelling words every week to work on so that what they learned was getting corrective feedback was actually a pleasure like oh good i don't now i mm -hmm. now i've got my 10 the teacher did it for me i misspelled 10 words now i've got them so like they had to be very thoughtful because most of these students had come from other places where they hadn't been successful either right. either they weren't you know academically successful or they were academically successful but miserable or not meeting their potential so there was so much unlearning that had to be done very overtly and I'm curious yep. what you what you recommend and what you do and you see to kind of, you know, people who've been working for decades and are kind of jaded and you're let's you're trying to create a new culture at work. Either they've come to a new place or the culture in the existing place is saying we've got to change things to be more we oriented. What kind of sort of overt big metaphorical structures do you like to to put in place so that people can change their mindsets. So the, the book and the premise in You, Me, We is often we will wait for the mysterious they to fix it. And if you want to have a friend at work, then you need to actually go first and be a friend at work. So we know, for example, Gallup has been researching engagement for nearly 20 years. One of the 12 questions they ask, question 10 is, do I have a best friend at work? And so we're changing it in the book on its head, because to me, do I have a best friend at work perpetuates the old culture because it allows me to sit back and say, no, I don't. Because how he got the promotion I wanted or how his team got the glamorous project. No, they were mean to me at lunchtime. It's like junior high that we're all taller and I don't need to do take ownership. Whereas if we turn that question on its head and say, am I a best friend at work? What are my values? What does fill my bucket? What is the environment in which I could thrive? How do I create that for me and others? 
that's how you can start to affect change. So when we're working with organizations that might be stuck in a pattern of behavior that is unhelpful, either we're being too nice and not giving the candid feedback, or we're having lots of meetings and talking about what should be done, but there's little action and accountability to follow through, then we will use tools like the Ally Mindset Profile to say, well, here are your individual and collective patterns, preferences. And now it's the survey says mm. versus finger pointing and blame. That allows leaders to lean in and then move to the let's create a picture of what it could be. Could be. What will that look and feel like? What are the processes and systems? How will you need to show up differently in order to make that a reality? And I'll give you an example. Like during the pandemic, we all switched to using Zoom or WebEx or whatever platform you're using. But the sense of isolation, loneliness, and um, disconnect has increased during the last two years. So technology gives us the illusion of connection. But what was happening is we get onto back-to-back -back Zoom meetings. The first thing somebody says is, where's your project plan? How's it doing? What, what are you doing? What's the progress report? What we're not doing is the scheduled spontaneity of the water cooler conversations, the first five minutes while we're waiting for everybody to walk into the meeting, the small talk. So one of the simple tactics that many of our leaders are adopting is they allow three to five minutes at the beginning where they literally have a question of the day or grab something from your desk that represents you and let's talk about it. They're putting some of the fun and the human back into the checklist day. And that is causing, I've seen it. We had one client whose uh, employee engagement scores were negative numbers. I mean, they were not just bad, they were terrible. And as a cohort, the leaders, all the people managers went through a leadership program with us and over, it took two years, it went from negative to single digits to double digits. And now in the third year, it is in the high 40s and growing. And it was because they were intentional and they prioritized communication. They prioritized the relationships in support of the business goals. So you don't have to do one or the other. But choosing how to show up, it is the most powerful thing that you can do. Mm. Yeah, and I love the story you tell about that Gallup question, which almost got omitted because it seems yep. like such a either a fluffy, irrelevant question mm -hmm. or kind of like the way I was thinking about it is like, you know, you bring this uh, very fragile rainforest plant <laughs> And you put it on your desk yeah. and like it takes so like like you really need to like spend a lot of time and care just keeping it alive. Like if you're the sort of person who needs a best friend at work, maybe you're not right for this organization because you seem really needy. So uh, I've, I've had that opportunity. Most of my clients are IT technology and engineering. So I've been to North Slope, Alaska with oil and gas drilling where it literally is life or death. And, you know, you're there for two weeks. Best prime rib ever. I've been to Chile and Peru, Peru with gold mining um, clients. And within the last few years, Eric on my team, co-author of the book, wrote a safety leadership program for an oil company. And most of the people going out onto their drilling sites were not W2 employees, they were independent contractors. So they had little positional power in terms of you're fired if you don't follow our safety rules. And so, Eric, we don't do OSHA training. That's why OSHA exists. But what we did do and what Eric did was create a le safety leadership program based about the, the more we know, like, and trust each other, the more likely I am to call you out if you're not wearing your safety goggles, if you're not beeping your horn twice before you back your truck out, et cetera, et cetera. And he pitched it to the client thinking, oh, they'll never go for this, too touchy-feely. Well, they did go for it. We had the most emotional experience with the leaders going through the program as they got to share their safety journey, their safety leadership message. Why was going home in one piece important to them? And they were talking about family and friends and so on. 
they also then saw an 18% reduction in the reportable injuries that they were experiencing on site. And it was all because we went with the misnomered touchy-feely program built around no like trust and the quality of the relationships that people had on those sites. That's the difference it can make. It can literally save lives. Mm. So, he, so I'm curious about like other things. Cause I've, I've worked with, uh, with a company that was trying to get to like, you know, how many days without an accident, right? They were doing mm -hmm. the, you know, great game of business sort of. And one of the like, you know, culture and discussion and emotional intelligence was a part of it. But a bigger part was they discovered various incentives to, to do the opposite, right? There were incentives for speed. There were incentives for not shutting down mm -hmm. the line. Um, I'm, I'm working with a client right now. They're trying to come together in a very difficult time. And yet their compensation plans incentivize zero sum rivalry. Mm -hmm. Right. So how, how do those things get uncovered? Because you can tell people to be nice to each other and to, you know, all day long. But if if they're getting other messages, it's hard to, uh, you know, to believe. It is hard. And again, it's an individual choice because ultimately there is a finite bonus pool. There is only one CEO job. So as it comes to it, you'll either get it or I'll get it. I need to be able to celebrate your success. And so, again, it's that candid conversation of two team leaders, for example. OK, so we're incentivized for different things, but how do we work together in spite of those differences to achieve mutual success versus the win-lose approach that that might otherwise engender? And if we think about um, intent to say we're seeing the great resignation, we're seeing the quiet quitting, all of those headlines, when you actually start picking at that data, it is all around, am I having fun at work? Do I look forward to coming into work? And if I'm in an environment where it's a dog eat dog and I've got to watch my back for who's going to get me next, then I'm not having fun and I'm not looking forward to the environment. And therefore, I'm more likely to either show up and do just the bare minimum or I'm going to quit and go somewhere else. Either way, the organization loses. So at some point, you may need to change those processes, change the comp plan. But in the short term, you as a leader, A, get to, show, to determine how you show up. You then get to influence the culture of the people on your team around your table. And then you get to influence up and downstream. And I've seen it. I've seen it transform individual leadership reputations from at best brilliant jerk, at worst jerk to ally and a go-to leader just by simply asking questions versus barking orders, by slowing down a, you know, a hair's breadth versus running ahead and leaving your team behind because you're moving too fast for them to process or get the context. I've seen it transform teams where that infighting you've described was holding them back and resetting expectations for how do we move forward? Because the chip on the shoulder that you're carrying from years ago, because somebody was mean to you at playtime, they've forgotten about it. It's only holding you back. And it's stopping those around you from leaning in and having your back now because they just detect with their spidey sense, the emotional intelligence you talked about, that something's up, that they can't quite trust you. So again, it comes back to, it starts with me. What's important? How do I define being a great leader? What do you need? And then am I leaning into that? Am I doing my best? Mm. Um. So what for you, when you were reading through it, I mean, you were arguing with a book, which I love. I look forward mm -hmm. to us being able to do that over a dinner or lunch at some point. But when you mm -hmm. thought about those five practices, the abundance and generosity, connection and compassion, Courage and vulnerability, candor and debate, action and accountability. Which would you say is your natural strength, Howie, and which is the one where it could do with some care and attention? Um, that's a wonderful question. Um, I think I tend to lean towards overabundance and generosity. I kind of want, you know, I think that's very a very easy place for me to go. And I want to say that, that too much is just as bad as not enough in just in, in every single one of these. 
Right. So if I'm doing yeah. it out of this, you know, somebody hurt me in fourth grade and now my defense is I just want everyone to approve of me, I can give things mm-hmm. away that don't that don't help anyone. So I can, you know, I feel yeah. like I'm really strong at that and I can be too strong at that. Mm-hmm. Right. Like I've never had a sponsor for this podcast. I'm like, ooh, you know, commercial uh, sponsorship, icky making money from this icky. So as a result, you know, as I said, we said before we started recording, I don't have an editor. I don't have a producer. Um, I'm doing it all myself. I've done it for 13, you know, for 12 years now and 10 years now. And um, could this be a much more influential podcast if I had gotten over myself as our friend Marshall Goldsmith says, yeah, like possibly. Right. Um, and and that's it but that's why it's important that only you get to decide so it's fabulous that this is the personal how he does it um, podcast by your standards and I I think I do the same abundance and generosity to excess we've all done it we've all said yes to something and then sat down to do the something and gnashing our teeth going like why the heck did we do this I've got too much on or they aren't grateful well that's Mm -hmm. a signal that it's overplayed and either we need to learn to say no or filter the request instead of saying no to everything we're taking, just a part of it, mm-hmm. and then making our choices because then then it's okay. Then right. it's okay. Right. And, yeah, and it's a very dynamic flow and we can be up one day. So, like, another interesting one that I was, you know, arguing about was the courage and vulnerability where mm-hmm. I feel like okay. – I have I am really good at vulnerability to the point mm-hmm. of self-deprecation to the point and now as you know sort of a public figure in some ways in some circumstances that my vulnerability comes across to me as performative even though it's not like I'll post something that that people say oh my god you have so much courage to reveal that and to me it doesn't feel like courage at all it's almost like, like, I know that no one's going to, you know, that I'm not going to have a backlash. And, and what I really don't want people to do is to say that, like, oh, my gosh, you have so much courage. You're so like, I just told you something about myself that I'm not proud of. And you're like, oh, you're so great for sharing that thing. I'm like, like no, 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 no. I honestly. This. What if that comment was less about you and more about them? Because vulnerability is something that I'm learning to get better at. Um, I've spent most of my life as a buttoned up British woman. That's how I like to at least excuse the behavior of presenting the professional mask and everything is under control and I know what I'm doing. I'm getting better at showing the vulnerability of the mistakes I've made or when I'm unsure. And I know that if I was saying that to you, Howie, oh my God, you're so brave. It's because in my head, I'm thinking, because I'm not. Mm -hmm. And so would it change your experience of people saying that to you if you received that as the gift it is, which is your vulnerability, which is easy peasy lemon squeezy, is inspiring them to potentially ask for help or offer help or take help Mm. Um, whichever format in their yeah. own world, and yeah. in their own I th- lives. I think that will help me. Um, I don't know that it's always accurate. Sometimes, you know, what the, the message that I get is I could never do that. So it's almost like it becomes a reason for them to maintain their, their you know, emotional rigidity and, mm-hmm. and, their, and keeping their armor on. But I'll start. I'll certainly be listening. Stick up a lip. Yeah, I'll certainly be listening for that. Um, mm-hmm. So the and the uh, the last question I had about abundance, where um, right, and you and you kind of alluded to this, like there's only a set bonus pool, so it's it's not infinite, it's not unlimited, and you talk about it in the book. There are places where. Things have to be balanced, but I'm, I'm I'm curious about like you talk about like who who is the we, if the we is like me and my best friend at work versus the rest of the team, or it's the team versus and the division versus the rest of the organization, or ideally it's the whole organization. I'm still thinking that that's a 
a narrow ecosystem, that that's the organizational boundary. <laughs> like, so, so, right, like there's a bigger we, yeah, there's, there's the, the world is our stakeholders. And as the world gets smaller, you know, I found myself saying, you know, can a company that is still devoted to like winning in the marketplace or like an oil company that is, you know, extracting resources, like is, is there a need for a bigger, can you, can we make this work in a bigger we with, where the, the entire planet and everyone is, is a part of the we? Oh my God, I'd get goosebumps of that. So if I'm going to be vulnerable, my dream job, an inspiration for some of this is Star Trek The Next Generation, Jean-Luc Picard, where everybody is working on the enterprise for the good of, now in the moment that we is the Federation of Planets and there are still enemies at which whom they are fighting and, and whatever. But that would be the ultimate for me. Yeah, let's give everybody a copy. Now the print run would be pretty extensive if we're going to give a copy to everybody on the planet. But going back to what you say, you think about the recent announcement by the founders of the company Patagonia. Mm -hmm. Not only were they already investing in just beyond them as uh, founders or their family or the employees of Patagonia, they brought great tracts of land, Patagonia, um, to preserve the wildlife and the flora and fauna. And then the recent announcement was that the whole company is being put in a trust for the good of the many going forward. And so, Howie, you're, a, you're a, an A-star student. You're thinking, if we all thought about this, because planet Earth is a finite resource, we're all going to be the same dead in the climate wars if we aren't all paying attention. But our ability to influence that at the moment is smaller. So if I can focus on me and you and the we that the two of us have, if in return, the two of us then focus on the we that we can have with Eric and Ruby and your team and your family. You know, it gets a ripple effect that starts to affect change. And there will be naysayers and there will be skeptics and there will be the people who just aren't ready to buy into it. And that's fine because there are plenty of people like yourself, like me, like Eric, like Ruby, like the leaders that have gone through this program who are trying to affect change here and now. So let's give them the language and framework to do that. And we can get to the others tomorrow, next year, in due course. Mm. But yes, I love where you went with that. It gives me goosebumps as an idea. It actually terrifies me and triggers my vulnerability of, but that's too much too soon. People are now going to think, oh, this is a, an airy fairy pie in the sky book. But ultimately, the yes, that's where it would lead if we all lean into this. Hmm. Love that. By the way, you'll see I have the Jean-Luc Picard haircut. You do. Very dashing it is, too. Thank you very much there, Howie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, when you're, when you're running a starship, you don't have time for personal grooming. You just got to keep it simple. No, you don't. And at least they give you a uniform, so you don't have to worry about what you're going to wear. Right. <laughs> So what, when we get to connection and compassion, so I, I, pull, I pull out very mm -hmm. few quotes. Mostly it's my own words, but I did pull out this okay. quote that I think may become like one of the top Kindle highlights. I don't know if you have access to that data yet. Oh, but, um, I, no, I know it's too soon, but I'll go look. It, it's this sentence. Cultivating allies is about discussing the undiscussables before they become barriers. Mm -hmm. What a mm -hmm. brilliant phrase. Could you talk about that? Yeah, well, it's that whole niggly thing. Like, um, so when Ruby first came to Sky Team, for example, um, she would email me and she'd be like, hi, Morag, how was your weekend? La -di -da -di -da. And by the way, I'm going to and yeah, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And then I would reply and there would be a question in there and I'd go back with yes. And it would be, so it'd be the long email and then yes. And it got to the point because we hadn't done the discussables the undiscussable was, is Morag mad at me? Mm. Because I didn't do the dear Ruby, love Morag, hearts and flowers. I just did the yes, because I trusted her from the get-go. I know, I knew from the get-go that she was going to be an amazing coach, an amazing facilitator. Go do it, Ruby. I've got your back. But because I hadn't made that explicit, she was reading between the lines and taking my short emails as, oh, Morag's mad at me. So she talks to Eric and Eric goes, oh gosh, no. 
And now when she comes to me and I get told this feedback, feed forward, I can now, and I was thinking, well, I wonder how many of my clients, I wonder how many other people obviously need this. So I, even to this day, I'll write the email and I'll go back and go the, oh, how are you? It's so much fun to be on your podcast. How was your weekend? Chatty, chatty. Then the business bit and then a nice sign off. And that's just how I need to flex my style in order to show up with connection and compassion. And so that whole comment about making the implicit explicit, being willing to talk about the undiscussables before they become an issue is so important. And I'll often have leaders to say, well, you know, Howie and I, we've worked together for 10 years. He's going to think I'm soft if I do this. Yeah, but in those 10 years, the rules of engagement have shifted. And if you aren't continually recalibrating your relationships, what's working, what's not, it's going to fester. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, as humans, we tend to be hardwired to assume the worst and assume it's personal, i.e. Morag doesn't like me and therefore I'm about to get fired. You know, it goes into this downward spiral. Whereas if, and as she did, Ruby leans in and says, hey, Morag, is, am I reading this right or not? I can correct that and also adjust how I show up in that relationship to reduce the risk of that undermining our mutual success going forward. Mm. Does that help kind of position it and paint a picture for how many times do we go home at the end of the day saying, oh, my goodness, you won't believe what so-and-so said or did. You won't believe what the, the company is going to do. But we don't have that conversation at work. We have it at home with the dog, with the significant other, the very people who cannot do anything about it. Right. Discussing well, the undiscussables yeah, is you take that back. Yeah, well, that's the uh, the other the the um, like escape valve for the undiscussables is what you call BMW, right? Uh... Yeah, bitch, moan, and whine. Right. So you know you're not being <laughs> yeah, you're not being stoic it. about it. You're just venting in places where it can't help. And what's worse is it causes a ripple effect because when we take our bad day home, whether it's leave the bedroom office or whatever, and then we BMW, bitch, moan and whine to our friends and family, they then get some of that emotional contagion and it affects them. And vice versa, which comes back to we can't separate work and life. There is no work and life. There is life of which work is a part of it. And if we have the sort of relationship where we can turn up and say, you know what, I had an argument with the dog this morning. It refused to go outside or had a bad evening with my spouse or, you know, something's happened to a friend, they're seriously sick. It's preying on my mind today. Just give me the benefit of the doubt. When we make that explicit, it makes it easier for others to lean in and help us to understand and not write a story that undermines us when it may be just be two degrees removed. Mm. Yeah, just just being able to speak it, you know, gives other permit people permission to speak it as well, we're, we're, you know, we're supposed to show up as like homo economists, yeah. right? Eco homo economicus, mm -hmm. right? Totally rational at work because we're here to make a profit and emotions and feelings are distractions at best. And yet everybody in marketing will tell you marketing and sales, every sale is an emotional purchase first and a logic afterwards. And so the idea of trying to delineate and make us into robots just seems so naive and short sighted. And again, how do you do this? One conversation, one email, one meeting at a time. And even if I fluff it in this conversation, there's the next conversation, the next email, the next meeting mm. where I get to make a choice. How do I need to show up in order to be the best version and meet my goals whilst also being what you need to help you to achieve your goals so that we can be better together? All right. So one, one of the tools I find really helpful to work with my clients on this, on sort of, which is because that's because discussing the undiscussables and saying, hey, I was this is I'm wondering is a form of sort of courage and vulnerability in and of itself to make the, to, to risk that kind of connection. Mm -hmm. So this, you know, some techniques I got from ACT, from acceptance and commitment training is to use a sentence like, hey, there's a there's a voice in my head saying or my mind is telling me that. OK. Right. Which, yeah. Which I, pe people then don't feel it's like, oh, I think Morag's mad at me. But there's a voice in my head that's saying that you're mad at me. And I just 
Why not to check it out? Yeah. Right. It, it kind of, My it spidey kind of... sense says you've got something you want to say or, hey, Howie, I saw you lean in there. Was there something you wanted to add? And it's just by asking the question, it brings others in and allows them to tell their story versus us making assumptions and applying labels. Right. And, you know, as, as coaches, I think one of our core functions is to see the people we're coaching, to see our clients as capable people of good intention. Right. Mm -hmm. So whenever there there comes a judgment, as it, when we judge people all the time because we're human too, I think the coach's trick is to turn our judgment into an immediate curiosity. Like, what am I not seeing yes. that leads me to to have that thought that that negative thought about them, and then to be able well, to ask. think about it. for everybody on this call. When was the last time you woke up in the morning thinking today I'm going to make a mistake? Today, I wanted to deliver a subpar performance. <laughs> None of us. And yet we point the finger of blame of you've made a mistake. You did it on purpose. You've delivered subpar results without thinking, well, actually, nobody ever intentionally sets out to do that. And so if nobody sets out to do it, what contributes to it goes back to your comment there about curiosity. And what is my role, the contributory negligence, in uh, creating this situation, did I not articulate expectations well enough? Did I not give you the skills or the equipment or the tools that you needed to be successful? Was I just not paying attention when you were subtly asking for help because you did not yet have the courage and vulnerability to say, first time I've ever done this, Morag, I've got no idea. Would you just tell me what I should do or who I should ask? And that's our role. And Again, I've worked with so many leaders. I've made the mistakes myself. Too blinkered, assuming, well, how he's got 20 years in the business, he'll work it out. And you will. But at what cost? And how more how more quickly could we get there if I just slowed down long enough to say, so, Howie, you've done this before. Tell me how you've approached it. Oh, glad you shared that, because in this company, that would. Mm. So we need to just tweak it here. Mm. That's That's the power of being an ally, of showing up connecting with compassion, not making the assumptions that can truly help us all to be more successful and have fun doing it. Yeah. I mean, I love this because, you know, a lot of my work is helping people prepare for the next level of leadership. And, you know, the, the, the fundamental thing that people need to develop in order to rise is a greater sense of responsibility, whether it's an illusion or not. This idea mm -hmm. that, that you're saying, like, you're the one who has to show up. Don't wait for a friend at work. Be a friend at work. Don't wait for the culture to change. Be the change. You know, the, peop the people who become top leaders in healthy organizations and well-functioning organizations are the ones who say, okay, I have a role here. And, you know, I love that phrase. Uh, it was a contributory negligence. Is that what you were, mm -hmm. you were saying? Like, yeah. like, to just think. Like, it, you know, you can have that thought and just beat yourself up and be miserable. Like, it's all my fault. But you could also say, I have I have a responsibility here. I have a power. I don't know what it is yet, but something's not working. Something's not right. Something's not ideal. And who but me to to step up? Yeah. And if you've stepped up and done everything you can and the environment is still toxic or not a great fit, then you can leave find somewhere where you can thrive but do it knowing that you tried everything that you could versus just either staying stuck or leaving and not making that change right. so it's intentionality through the the heart of all of this yeah one and one of the things that i've learned from my co-author and your friend peter bregman is the moment mm -hmm. when you think boy i've got to get out of here is precisely the moment where your ability to be candid and your ability to show courage and vulnerability is at its greatest because you've you now have much less to lose than you had when you were yes. committed to staying. So there, there's a huge power in being willing yeah. to walk away on your own terms, to stay on because your own terms. Because think about it, the courage and vulnerability, the candor that you might bring in that moment, what's the worst that happens? Nothing changes. You've already decided to leave anyway. Yeah. But what's the best hope for outcome? People listen, people change, the environment changes, and you get to stay, but in a much healthier environment. 
And that's powerful. So choosing to speak sooner before the molehill becomes the mountain is the better way to go. But if you're already at breaking point, then you have a choice. You're not a victim. And whatever happens in this fish pond that we're swimming in, just make sure you don't carry over the baggage of that into the new environment that you are showing up as a friend for yourself and others so that you can avoid repeating history. Mm. So one of the things I love about the book is you have there at the end, you have these questions that, you, you know, I, I thought, like, if people don't buy the book, you could just sell like five or six index cards with the questions that people could be asking themselves. So like there's there's a leader I'm thinking of that I'm working with right now. If he asked himself once a week, who is the unheard voice on your team? Yeah, would triple his effectiveness. OK, All right. I know I know of a, a, um, a team I've been working with where if they ask themselves and each other, what excites you about the work we do? What frustrates you about the work about the way we work together? They would need a lot less coaching. Right? Yes. <laughs> right. There's a, there's a way in which is we're, we're we're coaching, you know, trying to like put together a puzzle where none of the pieces want to fit together. Whereas if they are con connecting with each other, that it becomes much easier for the for the team to fit together if they're the ones doing the work rather than the coach, you know, try, yes. trying to do and the heavy lifting. And it's a version I, I, I use the same within our programs. So there's the relationship pulse check and you touched on two of the questions or similar questions, which is what's working, what's not, what's one thing I can do to help you or us succeed. Um, but it's the daily questions that Marshall Goldsmith um, talks about. And he has 32 of these and he pays somebody to call him every day, no matter where he is in the world, to, to hold him accountable. Yes, no, did you do these things? And so in the work that I'm doing with leaders, I mean, I was working with a group of IT leaders last month and we stopped and we were talking about the you, me, we concepts. And so it came to the, OK, now it's your turn to step up. So given where you are, what's important to you? What are your three to five daily questions that you're going to hold yourself accountable for? And write them down on the index card. We now have branded index cards. And much like you did, who's the voice that I need to hear? Who's the unusual suspect that I'm not inviting to the table? Because mm. we always invite the usual suspects, my direct reports and, you know, the loudest voice. But whatever it might be, did I pause? Did I do my best to pause before answering versus just jumping in? Did I do my best to ask one more question to role model curiosity before simply just sharing my point of view? Those are the sort of things that leaders I'm working with are putting down on their daily questions, three to five of them. Make them a habit and then you can switch them out and start again or add to your list if you wish. But three to five because we're all busy enough. But what's important? Right. And not only are they modeling those questions, they're also modeling growth in general. Right. Like yes. so many relationships, not just work relationships, but family relationships, friendships can just stagnate because neither one of the participants wants to, you know, rock the boat in some way. If you suddenly like show up at a different level with a friend, with a spouse, and just yeah. you know, like that, that gives everybody permission to grow. It does. And, and again, it's the asking at home, what's working, what's not, what's one thing I could do to be a better husband, wife, friend, sister, colleague, whatever you want to do, put in your own um, noun there. But it, that group of leaders I was working with last month, the IT leaders, one of the guys that we were talking about colleagues, you would jump at the chance to work with again and what made them special. And I've asked that question of thousands of leaders around the world. And invariably, it's not how smart they were or their technical competence. I mean, that comes out. Those are table stakes. It is always around how they made them feel, the coaching, the feedback. They gave me the kick in the pants. They gave me a, an opportunity before I thought I was ready, whatever it might be. They're just fun to hang out with. It's the human element. Mm -hmm. And so we were talking about that. And there's two parts to it. One is I said, OK, so I want you to send a message now to the person who's just come to mind. And this guy goes, but I haven't spoken to him in 10 years. I can't possibly like, yeah. I said, dare you, double dog, dare you. 
And so he did. And I, I'm telling you, the goosebumps I got and we all got when he got the reply back, which is, mate, it's been like too long and I can't wait. You know, let's get together. And it took no time at all. Just intentionality. He popped to mind. I even said, use me as the excuse. I'm on this workshop. I was asked to think about colleagues I'd want to work with again. The facilitator told me I had to send a message. So I'm messaging you. Yeah. And here's what I remember and I miss about you. I don't care. It had the end result deposit into the relationship bank account. And we can do that. We have those opportunities in front of us every single day. Mm. You just got to choose to follow through. You got to look up and notice them. You got to show up and then you've got to do it. That's, that's how you become the, the kicker being then if I ask the leaders their direct reports, who's a colleague you'd jump at the chance to work with again, would their names come up? And if not, then you need you, me, we. Lean in. Mm. Be the colleague that when you leave, there isn't a sigh of relief. There's a, oh, I'm going to miss you mm. before they then move on with their lives. But that's the difference. Are you creating the sigh of relief or are you creating a sigh of, oh, I'll miss you? Yeah, well, I'd love the framing. I know which one I'd rather have. Yeah, I love the framing, like, be the colleague that you want others to jump at the chance to work with again. Yeah. And how do you get there? You, by defining what means it means to you to be a good colleague. That's a great start. But also then saying, so how are you? How was it? What can I do for you? It's the questions you ask. What frustrates you about working with you? And it'll be like, well, Morag, you talk too fast. You interrupt. Okay, I'll slow down. And, and it's not, you know, the fact that I might interrupt because I'm excited about what you've said and I want to go deeper is irrelevant if the impact of it is that you're thinking I'm rude and therefore you don't have anything of value to say, yada, yada. So set your own definition. Hold yourself accountable for doing it, but ask for feedback on how is this coming across? Am I nailing the landing? Or am I fluffing the landing? In which case, now I've got a choice to adapt or continue. Love it. Love it. So uh, we, we've gone over the time that I've asked from you. So I want, <laughs> I want to be aware of, of uh, being, not being uh, greedy. Um, I would love to talk to you about bassooning and orchestras at some point, but... Uh, that may have to wait for another conversation. Let's let's indeed let's close with uh, you letting people know again about the name of the book and where they can find you and your team if they want to find out more. All right. So the book, first off, you, me, we, why we all need a friend at work and how to show up as one available from your favorite retailers. Please order it and write a review. Be my friend. Write a review on Amazon. Um, and then how can you learn more about me and the team at SkyTeam, S-K-Y-E, team.com. And certainly the Ally Mindset profile, which you are all welcome to do, SkyTeam.cloud, because it's a redirect, SkyTeam.cloud forward slash you, me, we. And of course, I'm on LinkedIn. Connect with me. Send me a message. It's me that will reply. And so uh, I would love to answer any questions and get to know you all. Sweet. Well, Morag, thank you so much for, for the work, for bringing so much heart to organizations and letting, letting that heart spill out into the commons and for taking the time today. My pleasure, Howie. It's been so much fun. All right. See you soon. Oh.